Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm Alex Ames, and this is Season 1, Books and Bitters, Adventures in Book Collecting, in which we explore the stories behind fascinating objects in the Rosenbach's collection and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day life. This episode is titled The Case for Libraries and Museums in a Troubled World, a discussion with Richard Ovenden, Bodley's librarian at the University of Oxford. Human knowledge is fragile. So too, it turns out, are free, open, democratic societies. One doesn't have to dig very deep into history to realize that a key strategy in the destruction of democratic freedoms is the destruction of knowledge. Libraries, archives, and museums are institutions built entirely on the principle that information and knowledge, as stored in artifacts like books, art, and digital media, should be preserved and shared. It comes as no surprise, then, that when libraries, archives, and museums are at risk, so too are the human liberties that have become especially closely associated with life in modern Western democratic nations, including the United States and the United Kingdom. This is a key theme in an important new book by Richard Ovenden, today's guest on the Rosenbach podcast. Richard's new study is titled Burning the Books, A History of the Deliberate Destruction of Knowledge, and it is published in the United States by the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press. Richard, who serves as chief executive of the library system at the University of Oxford, one of the oldest and most distinguished institutions of higher learning in the world, is uniquely positioned not only to reflect on past instances of knowledge destruction, but to offer insights on where our world is headed in terms of our free access to information and the current state of civic discourse in Western democracies in which internet technology and social media have dramatically altered the political Political and social landscape. Rosenbach podcast listeners will recall that the previous episode recounted the story of rare book dealer Dr. A. S. W. Rosenbach's work to help resettle European refugees fleeing Nazi violence in the 1930s, escaping a brutal regime closely associated with the practice of book burning. It seems right to engage in this discussion with Richard following our exploration of Dr. Rosenbach's political work during the era of the Third Reich. I'd like to tell you a bit more about our guest before we dive into the interview. Richard Ovenden has been Bodley's librarian, the senior executive position of the Bodley and Libraries at Oxford, since 2014. Prior to that, he held positions at Durham University Library, the House of Lords Library, the National Library of Scotland, and the University of Edinburgh. He moved to the Bodleian Libraries in 2003 as Keeper of Special Collections, becoming Deputy Librarian in 2011. He was educated at the University of Durham and University College London, and holds a professorial fellowship at Balliol College, Oxford. He is a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, the Royal Society of Arts, and a member of the American Philosophical Society right here in Philadelphia. In recognition of his services to librarianship, Richard was awarded the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's Birthday Honors in 2019. Thank you, Richard, for joining me on the Rosenbach Podcast. It's such a pleasure to be with you, and I'm only sorry that I'm not able to be speaking uh, in the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia itself. I mentioned in my introductory comments the story of Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach's work to raise funds for refugees in the 1930s by holding what was essentially a celebrity rare book auction in New York, which I discuss in detail on the previous episode of the Rosenbach podcast. One of the presenters that evening was the famous American journalist Dorothy Thompson, who had been expelled from Germany by the Nazis. In her spoken comments at the auction, Thompson remarked that, quote, it is poetic justice that this gathering of book lovers should come to the aid of the victims of those who are book burners, end quote. 
Your new study, Richard, is titled Burning the Books. So I'm wondering, what do Dorothy Thompson's words mean to you, and how do they resonate in our own time? Well, I think they go right to the heart of the issue that's been concerning me for a number of years now, and which I try to convey in my book, which is that knowledge is essential if we are to consider ourselves part of an open, democratic, free society. And I think that issue has been overlooked um, and it gets increasingly overlooked that the role that libraries and archives in particular play and the preservation of knowledge uh, that they um, undertake in their, their, their routine lives is um, of absolutely vital concern. And I think it, it, it has been for millennia, but it became particularly focused. And I think some of the most compelling and moving episodes in this history come from that period in the 1930s onwards that um, you, you discussed in the previous podcast. So um, I, I think that it, it really strikes uh, a very strong chord with me. And I think those same issues that were brought to light in the 1930s are still with us today. Thanks so much for sharing those insights. And you know, the, your response f- seems to me very much like a succinct overview of the argument that you put forward in your new book. Um, before we dive further into your scholarly work, however, I'd like to zoom out and ask you to help listeners get better acquainted, both with the University of Oxford and with the Bodleian Libraries. Uh, it seems like your book was heavily influenced by the vantage point from which you wrote it. Can you tell me a bit about the Bodleian Libraries and how they fit into the scholarly academic life at the University of Oxford? What does it mean to be Bodley's librarian? And especially for our American audience, can you say a word about what role Oxford plays in the civic and cultural life of the United Kingdom? Sure. I, and I think you're you're absolutely right. I, I, and one of the extraordinary things about being Bodley's librarian, I'm the 25th in just over 400 years, is that the the weight of history is can be seen all around you. The buildings um, that we inhabit, the office, the literal room that is my office, um, are historic spaces. They're spaces in which scholars, students, um, librarians and archivists have worked for hundreds and hundreds of years and in which the efforts and achievements of our predecessors surround us literally, um, not just on the paintings that hang on those walls, but in the very fabric of the buildings itself. And so um, the libraries. Uh, and in fact, last year we celebrated our 700th anniversary as a university library system in Oxford. The first library is founded in 1320 um, as part of the university church. Um, it was destroyed in the Reformation, a story I tell in my book, and was refounded by Sir Thomas Bodley, uh, a wealthy um, businessman and courtier to, in, uh, to Elizabeth I at the end of the 16th century. And that history, though um, the ups and downs of the library, the building of its collections, the challenges that our predecessors have faced, are a well which myself and my predecessors have drawn on for inspiration and for courage as we face the challenges of day, like the pandemic that we are still in and have, have lived through for the past 15 or 16 months. And, you know, right at the beginning of that time, I was able to remind my colleagues that, you know, we had lived through the plague of the 17th century as a library service, that we had faced the siege of Oxford during the English Civil War, that we had faced um, bombing raids by um, the Nazis. So we could face the pandemic and come out the other side. And so those episodes in history are incredibly helpful, but they can also be a burden because libraries have to change. Libraries and archives are evolving institutions, and indeed the university um, the university is too. So we can't be fixed in the past. We've got to remain 
agile and to continue to adapt and innovate whilst at the same time remaining true to our core mission, true to the um, the the impetus that our founder uh, uh, gave us um, back in the late 16th century. And what that means today is that we have enormous collections, we have beautiful buildings, we have fantastic staff, um, and we're able to operate in 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 the ways that we are both a university library that we serve the students and the faculty of the University of Oxford, you know, one of the leading universities in in the world. But we're also a national library. Um, we're a legal deposit library. We hold major political archives under the 1958 Public Records Act. Um, but we're also an international scholarly and cultural repository. And that, um, if you like, triplicate role that we fulfill is something which we have to balance our service provision, but it gives us enormous um, opportunity to do really interesting things, um, to engage with other institutions and other scholars from around the world, um, and, and to be able to generate benefits for the different communities that we serve because we have this great range and variety of, um, of, of stakeholders, of users, and of supporters. Richard, I imagine your life as Bodley's librarian is occupied with many, many administrative leadership duties that keep you very busy. What inspired you to write this book in the midst of all of your other work? And why jump headfirst into some of the complex political and civic issues of our time? Well, I think that that's a great question. Uh, and I think that libraries and archives are civic institutions. And so why shouldn't we be part of that civic discourse? And I think librarians and archivists and, and those at the head of those institutions are um, sometimes quite reticent about sticking their um, head above the parapet and engaging in that civic discourse. And I think that's something that we have suffered from in recent years, recent decades perhaps, in that we haven't been part of those big conversations and part of the, um, the public policy debate. And I began to be increasingly concerned that we were losing ground in those uh, conversations, that we weren't being heard, and that the role that we play was consequently not being recognized, justified, or funded. And I was particularly concerned, partly within my own profession, that the place that preservation has played was taking increasingly second fiddle to access and of course there's you you know access is absolutely at the heart of everything we do every decision we take every every decision that i take as my leader is about putting knowledge in the hands of readers but you can't do that unless you've preserved that knowledge in the first place and i think that that role that function has become um, less critical um, to, the, to, to the missions of libraries and archives and to some extent less recognized by society. And I wanted to draw back um, the attention to that function and I wanted to look at it in the, through the lens of what happens when we lose a library. And that could, to me, that could serve to functions that could address some of those concerns to within my own profession you know let, let's let's not forget the centrality of preservation but also it could speak more directly to some of what i was seeing as some of the big risks that society faced when it doesn't allow libraries and archives to perform that role for for a whole variety of reasons and there was a a couple of triggers for this to me. One was actually going back to your previous podcast, walking around central Berlin um, uh, just 
ahead of going into a meeting in the Staatsbibliothek on Unter den Linden and stumbling really across um, Babelplatz, this the site of that historic book burning on the 10th of May 1933, orchestrated by Goebbels and the Nazi party, and from which flowed so much destruction of knowledge. And it, as I was looking at a very kind of moving plaque in that space, it, it came to me that actually my own mother, uh, still happily with us, was actually alive when this happened. She was a child, but, you know, this great cataclysmic event took place within living memory. And I thought, we don't make enough of this today. This was, you know, we, we need to be reminded of these um, you know, these terrible events. And then shortly after that happened, um, there became clear in the UK newspapers that, um, and in the midst of a very aggressive uh, immigration policy being implemented by the UK's Home Office, um, that um, the a, a great important body of records was deliberately destroyed by that same government department, the Home Office, which could have been used by citizens who are being challenged to prove their right to remain in the UK in the face of this very aggressive um, a very controversial immigration policy known as the hostile environment. And that seemed to me to be a great use case of the social importance of preserving knowledge. You know, the very rights of citizens were at stake and, you know, some of those citizens who had been challenged of uh, the so-called Windrush um, era um, uh, uh, immigrants um, actually took their own lives or they were deported illegally, as it turns out, um, And but they could have defended themselves if they'd had access to that archive of uh, information. And so that really was the trigger that made me write the book, and it's... Um, it, the, the research and the discussions that I had informing the book brought many other kind of current uh, issues to light, particularly around the challenges that the current digital um, domain brings to society today. One of the most striking things about your book is its chronological breadth, as well as the geographical and cultural ex expanse that you cover in the volume. Why did you decide to write such a sweeping history? Um, from from the comments that you just shared, I can imagine that another version of this project would have been a much more a chronologically focused study, perhaps re really honing in entirely on the digital revolution, for example. It's a really interesting um, question, uh, Alexander. I, I think the answer to that, why did I take such a broad sweep of history, um, is partly because... Um, I'm a glutton for punishment, but partly just really about uh, curiosity. I'm, a, you know, a historian um, by training. I'm a member of the history faculty at Oxford, and um, I was just very curious about some of these incidents in the past, and particularly from the ancient world, of which I'm really quite sort of ill-equipped from my own uh, previous uh, training to tackle. But I was very, very intrigued by going to an exhibition at the British Museum called I Am Ashurbanipal that ran in uh, 2018. And that had a library at its heart, a cuneiform library, a library of clay tablets, a library unlike any I'd seen. And the story of how that library was formed in the 7th century before the Christian era um, and how it was uncovered through, you know, sort of, er, you know, early archaeological excavations um, in the middle of the 19th century and then transported um to, to England, largely it's now in the British Museum, um, again, somewhat controversially, I think. Um, th th that, that provided to me a very interesting starting point and one that I was surprised to learn about, and I thought the readers of this book might also be um, I I interested and intrigued by that story. Um, but also because, you know, part of my own research deals with the, the the Reformation and the Renaissance period that I I was very interested and done work on that 
on that period myself. So I, I was keen to kind of delve deeper into some of those particular stories and then you're absolutely right the um the the, the book could easily have uh, ac- accommodated the same page count just on the 20th and 21st centuries so uh, i i guess most of the st- most of the case studies are are from you know 100 years or so um go but um i i felt that that um, historical sweep would provide enough of interest to um, to the general reader, but also it would uh, illuminate some themes across time that I think are useful. And those themes are the motivations for destroying knowledge that continue uh, and are, are are can trace their origins back into um into antiquity but also the response that sort of human urge to preserve that human urge to retain witnesses to the past and to the present to inform the future and it's actually quite useful i think to be reminded that that is actually a core human uh, emotion a core human response to the destruction of knowledge throughout history In the introduction to the book, you write that, quote, libraries are crucial for the healthy functioning of society, end quote. Why? I think libraries are crucial for the healthy functioning of society for five reasons, and I bring these together at the end of my book in a coda. And they're about, some of them are actually, I think, quite obvious and straightforward, education you know libraries are there to educate people i was educated in a library as a child a free library a public library um and it transformed my life chances through having access free access to knowledge and i was able to educate myself in that library to some extent and libraries continue to educate whether they're educating senior researchers working on vaccines in the University of Oxford or um, uh, school children in more economically and socially challenged parts of major cities um, across the world. So they they are great levelling places for educational opportunity. But they're more than that. I think libraries and archives um, also provide um, opportunities to uh, uh, for communities to express and preserve their own identity, their identity as um, as in in localities. Um, you know, the local history of a region um, is. You know, our lives are enriched and informed and made better because of our knowledge of what has gone on in previous generations in our own communities, of the places, the buildings, uh, the streets that we inhabit in our daily lives. But they also help. Uh, communities of diaspora for example so as we become a more globally dispersed um, uh, society um, being able to latch on to uh, remnants of your own uh, ethnicity your own cultural origins your own heritage and patrimony they are they are helpful things they are things which again enrich our lives and bring meaning to um, the the traditions and the qualities that um, are part of our being. Uh, the third reason I think is around um, uh, is around diversity of knowledge, and I think that's something to do. I quote John Stuart Mill in my book, who um, argues, I think, in his famous book on liberty, that you you know you must have contrary opinions in order to test the truth and i think having a diversity of opinion whether that's a diversity of language a diversity of culture a diversity of um political or um uh, other opinions is is important and uh, and libraries are places where you can encounter those uh, diverse ideas and to be challenged by them to be inspired by them and, and to produce creativity as a result and innovation and the other uh, the other two reasons i think are, are are really much more fundamental and about rights and one of them is that libraries and archives are are places where rights are enshrined whether they are the rights uh, legal rights so 
uh, the laws of the land. You know, I used to work in the House of Lords in the UK Parliament, and uh, the House of Lords Record Office, now called the Parliamentary Archives, holds the legal copies, the sealed copies of the Acts of the United Kingdom. And going back to the Middle Ages, and they hold, um, they are the kind of, you know, the lodestone of the laws of our land. And today, you know, they're available online, uh, electronically, but the preservation of those, whether they're digital files or parchment scrolls, are absolutely at the core of what it is to um, have um, the rule of law and a legally, um, a, a legally healthy society. And, uh, you know, other rights are uh, contained within libraries and archives, whether they're um, the, the records of land holdings, uh, the, whether they're um, information about citizenship. Uh, all of these things can be used as defences for society and for the rights of individuals. And then finally, you know, we live in an age of contested facts, of uh, alternate facts, of fake news, and of, um, you know, increasingly contested views of the past. Well, libraries are reference points for facts and truth. And, you know, they are places uh, where not only those facts and truths are kept, but where falsehoods are also kept so that the those who pro uh, perpetrate them can be held to account. And more importantly, librarians and archivists are people who have the skills to be able to determine one from the other and to be able to place that guidance in the hands of, uh, of citizens. So they are the five reasons that I feel that libraries are absolutely essential for a healthy society today. Your book focuses mostly on libraries and archives, as we have been discussing, but you do make occasional references to museums. And I'm curious as to the extent to which your argument about information preservation extends to collections of objects that are not necessarily text-based, such as fine art, decorative arts, archaeological artifacts, and so on. This is of particular interest to me because the Rosenbach in Philadelphia is somewhat unique in that we are you know, a, a museum of the book, a museum of the written word in many senses, but we also have pretty substantial collections of, of fine and decorative art that, you know, um, add to the stories uh, that we tell. In what ways are these types of collections uh, similar in terms of their cultural significance, and in what ways do museum collections diverge in terms of the role that they play in civic life? Well, that's a really interesting point. And I think, um, you know, libraries and archives have had a kind of intertwined history going back actually into antiquity. You know, after all, the origin of the term museum comes from the, the Museon, one of the temples in the Great Library of Alexandria, uh, a place where the scholars who came to use the collections of the library would gather in a kind of what we today would call a kind of liberal arts college environment. And so um, that temple of the muses, which is where those scholars gathered, um, you know, three millennia ago or two or three millennia ago, um, shows the, the the interconnectedness of libraries and, and museums. And, uh, you know, the the, the Bodleian, I think, actually has a claim to be the first public museum in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, we held the um, uh, famous group of marbles called the Arundel Marbles, which later became the founding collection of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, uh, but, you know, we looked after them for almost a century before then. So uh, there, are, um, there are many points of... Uh, connection between the two but i think there are key differences and i think part of that those differences are the the point that libraries and archives perhaps more particularly archives hold uh, you know key evidential records legal and evidential records and so they may be census returns they may be the um you know the original sealed copies of Acts of the Parliament or Statutes of the Realm. Um, they may be um, the records of, you know, from l land registries. They may be um, other forms of uh, 
key legal and evidential records which are of such fundamental importance to society and of a kind of qualitative difference i would say not they're not better or worse than um uh you know um fine furniture or 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 ceramics or paintings um but they are they are different um and, and they they perform a kind of different function for society but there are strong areas of overlap i think the venn diagram between libraries archives and museums has a kind of you know quite a generous shaded area um where the the functions overlap and they certainly overlap on things like you know the educative power they overlap on um the the diversity issues they overlap on you know I- issues of creativity so um but I think there are there are distinctions. There are uh, and there are key aspects. There are key functions of libraries and archives that are not performed by museums. I'm really interested in the nuts and bolts of what we need to do to protect, revitalize, and showcase the place of libraries, archives, and museums in our democracy. Can you outline some practical steps that our governments, institutions, and professional communities need to take? I'm especially interested to hear your thoughts on what kinds of legislation might be required in both the United States and the United Kingdom to improve the health of our information infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I mean both the care of rare historic materials that have particular physical preservation needs and the effective preservation of digital media. I'm really glad you asked this question because I think it is of absolutely critical concern today. So I think there are, uh, and I could fill the whole podcast with this, um, and uh, I've been writing and thinking about some of these issues um, actually since the book was published. Uh, I've had a number of conversations along these lines. So I think some of it is the beginning of recognition that libraries and archives hold this important role for society. I think the the kind of educative um, power of libraries and obviously extending that to museums as well. In a society where um, particularly in certain particularly in in some Western countries where we're seeing declining levels of literacy for the first time, Um, you know, after, you know, centuries of one generation being more literate than next, we're now going backwards. And I think libraries have a particularly key role to play in reversing that trend. I think there are very important issues around uh, access to the internet and access to digital technologies and digital information that libraries provide, which um, for economically and socially challenged segments of our community. And um, uh, the sociologist at NYU, Eric Kleinenberg, in his book, Palaces for the People, makes a very kind of important claim that libraries are parts of social infrastructure. And I think that's something which I fully agree with Eric's point there. So I think something around uh, the funding levels for libraries, archives, and museums is of absolute critical concern. But that has to follow from... Um, the recognition of the role that they play. And so part of that public dialogue about uh, recognition would then trigger or lead to um, improved levels of funding commitment from various funding bodies, not just central and local government, but uh, philanthropic foundations and other, um, uh, uh, other sources of funding. I think other issues which are of concern to me are about libraries in schools. Um, certainly in the UK, uh, the, the, the um, school libraries have been in decline and are being challenged in many uh, communities. And I think we really need to see a resurgence of um, school libraries. And, uh, um, uh, and I think the particular role that school libraries can play and this is then true in uh, uh, later on as individuals get older um, is about information literacy and information skills training and I think librarians are particularly well placed to deliver this and I think it's particularly important when so much of our lives and increasing portions of our lives are spent online and being bombarded with electronic information 
and uh, uh, electronic information of very dubious provenance in many cases. And so being able to educate young people at the youngest age possible on how to navigate this particularly challenging um, aspect of our lives is of absolutely critical concern. And then I think um, there is a whole series of legislation needed around um, the power and dominance of the big tech companies, what my colleague at Oxford, Timothy Gartnash, calls the private superpowers. I mean, they have such a, um, a dominant position. They have such huge market share. They have massive participation on their platforms. And out of that, they leverage huge revenues. And so they're able to innovate and change and adapt their technology much faster than, um, if you like, public institutions like libraries, archives, and museums can. And I call in my book and elsewhere, um, in, in the pages of The Economist and the Financial Times, I've argued for um, a memory tax on the profits of the big tech companies in order to reinvest in that social infrastructure of libraries, archives, and museums, and to give uh, libraries and archives in particular the power to preserve um, electronic technology to preserve uh, digital knowledge and to put that power back in the hands of society and communities and to give them a chance um, in this increasingly um, chaotic and challenging world of um, digital information. And I'll give you just one example of that, which is very current here in the UK, which is around the use of um, encrypted and self-deleting technologies by government officials. So, um, you know, how can we know how public policy is being evolved and how public officials, whether they're uh, government ministers, whether they're civil servants, or special advisors in the political realm, how they are in enacting their business, how are they engaging with lobbyists, how are they engaging with the media. This is all information that is deserving of being preserved and needs to be preserved if we can hold those, uh, uh, those officials who, are, after all, are paid by the taxpayer. How can we hold them to account? And um, under legislation like the Presidential Records Act in the United States, 1955, of the Public Records Act in the UK, 1958, um, we established legislation after the Second World War in order to provide that control on the behaviour of our elected officials and their advisors. The use of technologies like Parler and Signal and Telegram are uh, evading uh, those pieces of legislation, and we actively in need to give um uh, to give teeth back to um to public bodies in order to make it possible for us to preserve the record of what is happening today what is what uh, what is going on right now um uh, both for the long-term historic value but also for um uh, the the sake of an open democratic society do you think there is a path forward in our different nations for this sort of public dialogue around the intersection of technology, open access, um, transparency in government to overcome our hyper-polarized partisan divides? On the one hand, we live in this era when any sort of meaningful government action can seem really distant just because of how divided our society is along traditional partisan lines. But I also feel like this particular issue might be able to build more of a consensus around it because it does sort of transcend the culture wars? I, I think I think that's true. I think that um, one of the things that has struck me over the last few years is just how um, communities do gather around institutions like libraries, archives, and museums, and that they are places where the individuals who work in them are trusted, that um, they are places where the communities feel that they are on their side. And I think that we should leverage that place in society that these institutions hold. And I think they can provide a place for 
where these key issues can be reflected upon. And I think the preservation of that information and making it available back to the community is part of that um, that function that libraries and archives have in enabling communities to face their past, whether that's a difficult past or a joyful past. And there are several episodes in my book where I think that has successfully happened. And I think the most um, compelling to me was in East Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany, where the records of the secret police, the Stasi, were placed back in the hands of the communities who were being uh, surveyed and spied on and made accessible to that community again and so they were able to face their difficult past and move beyond it as a result and i'd like to i'd like to think that um you know libraries archives and museums can play some of that role today in uh dealing with this uh you know some of these very contentious issues of um of our moment and that um we can, through educating young people especially in how to navigate this increasingly um, digital, uh, chaotic digital world, that they can, uh, that they're better equipped to make decisions about sources of information that may be um, hyperpolarized, that sources of information that may be deliberately being targeted at them because of the way that they are um, operating online. And so giving that those tools back to our communities, back to society, is one of the ways in which I think we'll be able to move beyond uh, the period that we're in, which seems so fraught and so difficult in the in the domain of communication uh, online. I'd like to return again to the charity book auction that Dr. Rosenbach sponsored so many years ago, and specifically the really interesting catalog that was printed in advance of it, which is described in detail in the last episode of, of the Rosenbach podcast. Professor Albert Einstein, who was himself a Jewish refugee living in the United States, wrote a preface to the catalog that contains the following words, quote, this catalog bears witness to an undertaking of practical aid on behalf of peoples in Europe who are being unjustly persecuted. It is an act of joint cooperation on the part of Christian and Jewish philanthropists who serve and remain true to the cause of humanity. In our times, it becomes particularly clear that humanity and readiness to serve mean more to society than all wisdom and all technical progress. For the possession of power as a tool is less decisive than the directed idea in which it is used. End quote. Richard, our own time is beset with all sorts of technological advances that have changed the way information is created, stored, exchanged, and preserved, as we have been discussing. Do you think Professor Einstein's words hold a message for us today? And if so, what is that message? My response to Einstein's thoughts back in the 1930s in that preface are, for us in our society today, we have to look back to the, the kind of core aspects of our society, of where we um, – where being able to understand where we come from, being able to understand um, the – differences and diversity of our society is something which is becoming increasingly difficult. And it's been difficult because we are being um, manipulated in the way that we access our sources of information. And the platforms and the tools which we use to source information are held in the private domain. They're held by major corporations who make money out of um, the manipulation of 
sources of information and knowledge. And some of that knowledge that has been manipulated, we actually create ourselves every time that we use those platforms. And it's being fired back at us. And what we need to do is both take control of how that knowledge, that public knowledge is being used, and to take ownership of it, literal ownership of it, but also ownership in a much broader societal sense, but also to try and find ways of getting back to different forms of interaction with knowledge that may be less convenient than going straight to digital technologies, going straight to our smartphone or going straight to our connected device of whatever kind it is, and actually taking the trouble, taking more effort to learn, to read, to um, read in a way that's not so distracted, in a way that's more concentrated, in a way that encourages a greater diversity of opinion, and a way in which I think more empathy can be generated through that process. And I think that um, we saw an absolutely historic and catastrophic lack of empathy, which underpinned the reasons why that charity auction was held and why Einstein wrote those words. And I'm very much afraid that we're coming back into an era where empathy is in increasingly short supply again. And I would like to say that libraries and archives and somewhat the traditional function of those institutions are sources of renewal of that empathy if we use them and channel them correctly. And that's not about abandoning uh, digital forms of communication. It's about seizing ownership of them and recognizing their, um, their benefits, but also their pitfalls. Thank you again, Richard, so very much for joining me for this conversation. And I do hope the next time you are in Philadelphia, you will stop by the Rosenbach for a visit. I can't wait, Alexander. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for tuning in to the Rosenbach Podcast. Please listen to other episodes for further glimpses into the Rosenbach's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, literature, and culture. To learn about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and we always welcome questions from podcast listeners about how to access and make use of our collections. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the world, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to the many things we have to offer online and in person. Thank you for your support. If you enjoy the introductory and concluding music featured on the podcast, which was composed and performed by Rosenbach Board of Directors member Yolanda Wisher and her band, The Afro Eaters, and was recorded at WRTI 90.1 in Philadelphia for NPR Live Sessions, visit WRTI.org to learn more. Also, please consider purchasing Yolanda Wisher's new album. Just visit Rosenbach.org for information. The Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast.